Good morning, and welcome to Manshack United Methodist Church on Facebook Live, our 8.30 worship service. So pleased that you are uh, with us this morning. Hope that you'll check in in the comment section and let others in the community know that you are here uh, with us. Our schedule this morning, if you come back with us at 9.30, if you have children, uh, Kim on Facebook Live will do, be doing her children's time. At 11 o'clock is our Life on the Road service uh, here on Facebook Live. Now, truth in advertising this morning, it's the exact same sermon that you'll hear here at 8.30 because I'll be preaching at Life on the Road this morning. However, uh, it is a different worship experience, different music, and other people that you can check in online with, so I hope you'll uh, be attentive to that opportunity. Speaking of opportunities, Vacation Bible School's Compassion Camp continues, uh, so I would invite you to the e-newsletter or to uh, the church website to learn more about that. It's been fun for me just to watch online to see uh, the children with their various activities that they have to do every week. Now this morning, uh, following this service, are two very special opportunities to celebrate communion. We're going to do drive-in communion on the west side of the parking lot as you come in. Uh, we'll give you the elements for communion and then uh, show you where to park and you'll turn your transmitter on, uh, I think to 88.3, but we'll tell you. And then we will celebrate communion together at either 9.45 or 10.15. You would be welcome at either time. On Friday, August 14th, another uh, fun opportunity to gather as a community online. Uh, we'll be having an evening of uh, watercoloring uh, led by uh, Leslie Pickett, and you will find more information about that in the uh, church e-newsletter. Again, that will be August 14th. Uh, for the month of August, our Nourishment at Noon continues. I'm on uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, and I'm starting a new series uh, this, uh, this month that I call Message in a Bobble, and I'm going to uh, show you some different biblical bobbleheads that my kids have gotten me and tell you a little bit about some of these biblical characters. On Tuesday, Mark uh, brings us um, education and edification uh, from uh, the world of um, music and and then on Thursday, Kim uh, has brought us uh, Bible study techniques, and more recently, a look at some of her favorite chapters in Romans. And then on Friday, Chanson and August Esparza usually uh, bring something, uh, most recently interviews with different uh, interesting people in our church. So be aware of this opportunity at noon uh, this week, Monday through uh, Friday. I'm uh, so glad that, uh, again, you are with us, and I'm Thank you not only for being with us online and being with us in spirit, but I hope you'll be with us in support as well. And uh, so I want to remind you to continually uh, faithfully uh, support our church with uh, your offerings. They are greatly appreciated and I believe put to effective use. Uh, one of the effective uses in our church was uh, the resumption of our food pantry. Uh, yesterday, we will be doing the food pantry every Saturday from 9 to 11 in the morning on the west side. So if you know of folks who could benefit from this, I hope that you'll let them know. If you'd like to contribute to the food pantry, you'll find a, a link in the um, uh, newsletter with uh, a list of things that you can bring. Uh, gift cards and uh, uh, check donations are also accepted. You'll also find this list on the east door uh, entrance to our church. You'll find a list you can pick up uh, of things you can drop off on Wednesday from 9 to 11. Uh, we'll be accepting donations. Yesterday, our very first day back, we had 19 families. So uh, somewhere, I suppose, between 75 and 85 people benefited from the food pantry. And we were so glad to be able to uh, help in this time of need. Glad again that you are with us. Let's uh, join by, um, in worship this morning by joining in the call to worship, uh, which is there for you on the screen. If you'll um, read the bold face, I'll read the light face. Peace-loving and peace-giving God, you bless us with your unfailing and unconditional love. We come to worship and praise our loving God and rejoice in God's tender mercy towards us. Generous God, you pour blessings and grace upon us, forgiving us for our sin and shame. We come to worship and honor our merciful God and rejoice in the wonder of forgiven and forgotten sin. 
Holy God, in the beauty of your shalom and in the glory of your presence, all barriers are lowered. We come to worship and revere our glorious God who enriches the lives of God's own people and speaks peace into the hearts of all faithful people. This morning we continue looking at the prophet Micah and you'll see about shalom and you'll see about lowered barriers. I hope that you'll watch for this as we continue to worship together. But now let's join in the well-known hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. church. Now is the time in our service where we worship and pray with one another and for one another. So let us turn to God in prayer. We pray today for our world, for our nation, for our community, our church, our family, and our friends, for all of those that we love and all of those who need love and especially need to know God's love. If you have prayer concerns or celebrations that you would like to share, please lift them up in the comments on Facebook, or you can private message us with private concerns. Let us go to God in prayer. God of life, you shared your peace with us when you gathered and formed us from the dust of the ground and breathed life into each of us. But life with you was not enough for us. Even in our rebellion, you clothe us and provide a way in the world. We are thankful that you continue to seek us, even in our wandering ways. Jesus, Prince of Peace, you separated us from sin in a way we never could, in a way we never can. You were a vessel of peace in a world that did not welcome you, but you persevered in love in the face of hatred. You taught us that forgiveness is possible even in the midst of extreme suffering. We are thankful that you continue to love us, even in our unrepentant ways. Holy Spirit, you hold peace within us despite our circumstances. You tend to the deepest parts of our inmost being nurturing peace so that we may grow. You lead us in paths of righteousness, showing us the way to bear love to the world. When hatred speaks its convincing lies, you show us the truth. We are thankful that you continue to sanctify us, even in our careworn ways. This morning, those who are grieving, 
provide peace and comfort. We lift up those who are weak, be their strength and healing. We lift up those who are in bondage to addiction, free them from their chains. We lift up those who have experienced rejection and abuse. Provide your arms of love. We lift up those who are hungry. Provide sustenance, both physically and spiritually, so that we may become instruments of peace, able to sow love so that hatred does not take root. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move in this place today. May peace and love abound in us and through us. In the certain hope that love overcomes all, we join our voices together using the words our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. One of the things that my wife and I have done in the evenings during uh, the pandemic is we have binge-watched some series on, uh, um, on Netflix. I think I've shared with a few people that one of our favorites, uh, and I guess because we watched all 66 episodes, was a, a telenovela that you had to, uh, unless you were very fluent in Spanish, had to look at the English subtitles. It was called Grand Hotel. It's like Downton Abbey, only it doesn't take itself quite as seriously. Uh, but we got into it, and, uh, and so we started watching and following uh, the characters. And so I began to get interested, like, what was going to happen to this character? Was he going to get out of this? Were they going to get together uh, and uh, find uh, the love that they kept missing each other on? And so I have to admit, I found online a series uh, ep of um, episode summaries and so I could look like four or five, six uh, 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 shows ahead and look at the summary and kind of see, were they together? Uh, was he still alive? I couldn't resist looking ahead. Have you ever done that? Uh, maybe you're reading a book and you got so caught up in the protagonist and hoped that she would uh, survive or find the answer to her dreams or that he would solve a problem that you skimmed ahead to the end of the book because you wanted to make sure that they were all right. Have you ever wanted to jump ahead? Sometimes in life, I think we wish we could jump ahead to pass the pandemic or to pass the current struggles we may have in our world or even in our personal life. And I think the Bible gives us an opportunity this morning to kind of skip ahead and see how it all comes out. And so one place to go, of course, would be to skip all the way to the end of the Bible in Revelation. But you don't have to do that to get a view of how the series is going to turn out. You only have to go about three-fourths of the way through to the book of Micah, where we have been the last couple weeks and will be for the next few weeks. Because in Micah chapter 4, we get a vision from the prophet Micah about what he calls the last days. We kind of skim forward uh, to see what's going to happen. I've uh, engaged in exercise both here at this church, at other churches, and with pastors in Africa that I call through the Bible in 40 minutes. And so I take uh, a timeline and all the major activities in the Bible from, from Genesis to Revelation to kind of give people an overview. And when I'm done, usually, I try to give them some theme sentences uh, to think about what they just took in over 40 minutes. And one of my favorite theme sentences is slavery to freedom. One of the great themes of the Bible is the slaves of Exodus. God frees and they start um, their own country, though they fall back into uh, slavery. In the New Testament, Jesus comes along to free us from slavery to sin and death. So slavery to freedom was one of them. Another one, which is kind of uh, one of my favorite, more modern ways to think about it, is uh, that the earth is, we can think of the Bible as the story of earth as God's fixer-upper. 
And that is, it started at one time pretty solid, and then Brown, Adam, and Eve in Genesis 3, and then by Noah's time, things have fallen apart. And the rest of the Bible are about kind of fixing the thing back up and putting it together. My favorite theologian, N.T. Wright, says that the Bible can be described in this sentence, it is God's rescue operation using restored people to restore creation. But also another one that I like to use is this. I'll tell uh, students that one of the ways to think of the Bible is it goes from garden, the Garden of Eden, to garden, the garden in Revelation 21 and 22. Uh, and it's, in other words, it's like a return to Eden. And so this morning as we come before the scripture here in Micah chapter 4, we really are seeing what we could call a return to Eden. So this is what Micah says about the last days, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 4. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established. As chief among the mountains, it will be raised above the hills and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Every man will sin under his own vine and under his own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid. For the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods. We will walk in the name of the Lord, our God, forever and ever. In that day, declares the Lord, I will gather the lame and I will assemble the exiles and those I've brought to grief. I'll make the lame a remnant and those driven away a strong nation. The Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day and forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to our God. So we skip to the end and we see how it turns out. And it's a beautiful ending. So this morning, I want to look at that ending and ask basically four questions. And the first question I want to ask is, what did we see here? In Micah chapter 4, if we had to describe what happens in, in the last days, how would we describe it? Well, we might say this. First of all, the last days are a time of peace. Notice that uh, nations have their disputes, strong nations, nations that are tempted to fight with one another, uh, have their disputes settled. So it is a time, um, we might say, of peace. It's a time, we might say, of prosperity. We're told that every man will sit under uh, his vine and fig tree. Now, if you've watched uh, uh, Hamilton on Disney+, Plus, the, that phrase may ring a bell. You'll remember George Washington says that when he wants to retire to Mount Vernon. He talks about wanting to sit under his vine and fig tree. So I got curious about it, and, and I thought, did George Washington really ever said that? Well, actually, he did. More than 50 times, Washington referred to sitting under his vine and fig tree. Now, where did Washington get that from? He got it from Micah 4. But where did Micah get it from? If you go back to 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25, it's talking about the reign of Solomon, when Solomon was in charge of Israel, and it's painting an idyllic time when everything rolls exactly as it should roll, and it says then that during Solomon's time, every person sat under their vine and their fig tree. The vine is a symbol of stability because it takes a while to grow a vineyard. Perhaps you've driven out into the hill country and taken tours of vineyards, and you probably know that they didn't get started and, uh, and reach their first uh, good crop in three months. It took a while. So it says basically there's stability enough that you can plant a vineyard. And a fig tree indicates um, both shade, so it's comfort in the, um, in the uh, semi-arid uh, places of Israel. It's comfort, but it's also sweetness. Uh, did your parents ever give you fig newtons when you were little? Well, basically, figs and honey were the only sweet things in biblical times. They didn't have chocolate. Uh, they didn't have um, cherry coke. Uh, they didn't have the kind of uh, refined uh, sugar uh, that we had. So if you wanted that sort of uh, a sweetness to your life, it was honey or it was Figs, so it's a time of prosperity, we might say. It's also a time of safety. We're told that they uh, take their um, 
uh, swords and beat them into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Now, I've always thought it's because they did this that there is peace. But if you look closely at the text, what it says is there's not safety because they've done these things, but they do these things because there's a sense of safety. Now, maybe it's chicken or egg, but basically nobody's going to take their implement of war and turn it into an implement of agriculture if they think they're going to need it to defend themselves. And we're told that, uh, and no one has a need to be afraid, so it's a place of safety, and fear is taken out of the equation. I've learned in my life that I can't eliminate fear, but what I try to do is when I take an action, I try to take fear out of that equation. What would our lives look like if we lived them without responding or acting in fear? I told some of you before, I love Elizabeth Gilbert, uh, a phrase about fear. She's the one who wrote the book, Eat, Pray, Love. She says this, she said, I can't get rid of fear in my life. So what I'd say to fear is, okay, we're going out for a drive and you're not going to be behind the wheel. You're not even going to be in the front seat. You're going to sit in the back seat, fear, and you don't get to call out any directions. And so that's, the, that's what we see in the end days. We see peace, prosperity, safety in the absence of fear. And we also see what we might say in our day we'd call inclusivity. And this is not just politically or theologically correct. This is biblical, um, that we're told that all the nations end up walking together. And we see that everyone has a place with God. Uh, so the first question is, what do we see? And we see this idyllic picture. The second place thing we might need to ask is, well, where do we see it? I think a lot of us, uh, when we think of these Bible promises, we kind of think of them as like Star Wars. You know, it's in a galaxy far, far away. But the fact of the matter is, Micah and Isaiah, who repeats much of what is in Isaiah, uh, uh, in Isaiah 2, much of what's in Michael, uh, Micah 4, both say, no, it's right here on the earth. In the ancient world, uh, before the Enlightenment and Renaissance, um, they would have maps of the world, and the very center of the earth was Jerusalem. Uh, And that was their biblical view of saying everything runs through Jerusalem, but it was another way of saying everything that is promised happens here on the earth. And so we see that um, this peace and prosperity and safety and, and this inclusion, it happens Right where we are. Now, when does it happen? Well, the Bible says the last days. But, and so I always think the last days are, well, like, they're a whole lot longer uh, and far away from me because, well, we hadn't even had college football season yet, so surely things can't end yet. But biblically, in the New Testament, last days mean any day since the coming of Jesus. Uh, if you want to check me on this, go to Hebrews, the first chapter. And the author of Hebrews will talk about in these last days and talk about Jesus. When the early church and New Testament thought about last days, they knew it could be any moment because uh, it is it the last days are now. That's what we're living in. And so when is it? I don't know, but it may be sooner than you and I think. And then finally, maybe the the sixty four thousand dollar question or the million dollar question with inflation would be this: How does this all happen? Well, the short answer is how it happens is God. But the longer answer is, if you read the Bible carefully, God always seems to want to work into partnership with us, that we join with God to help make the the dreams and ideals that God has for this planet become possible. So I thought we'd close by just looking at three things or hints we get in uh, Micah 4 that tell us what may lead to this idyllic situation. The first thing is this, that we're told that they go uh, to be taught by the Lord. All the nations come to be taught by the Lord and that the law of the Lord, and a better translation for this is teaching of the Lord, the Torah of the Lord, goes out. So in other words, one of the first things that happens to help us become the people and the world God wants us to be is that we learn. People are taught and people are learned. And this is a special kind of learning. It's not head knowledge, but it goes to the heart and out to the hands and the feet. And I love this. Uh, you perhaps uh, remember the, the old uh, folk song, I ain't going to study war no more, I ain't going to study war no more, based on Isaiah 2 and Micah 4. But really, I think the better translation is, I'm not, I ain't going to train for war. It's not just stuff in the head, but it, it, you're going to act on it. And so when you see we offer so many Bible studies and uh, teachings and nourishment at noons, what are we up to? Part of what we're up to is to try to partner with God 
uh, to give you stuff that we hope will go from your head to your hands and event, uh, your heart to the, eventually to your hands and feet and that you would live them out. Um, one of the wonderful additions to our church is having Pastor Jason and Pastor Chanson. And my wife always says one of the great things about their sermon is they usually don't quit their sermon without challenging you to do something about it in some way. And that's what it is to learn from the Lord, to, to be retrained to change our habits. I hope you'll be attentive to new studies coming in August and this fall where you can have your habits retrained. Another thing that we'll find is it seems to be there is a a spirit of acceptance that's practiced on the mountain of the Lord, that all the nations are there and they they can have their gods. It says they may have other gods. Uh, There's not a sense that we have to reprove them, correct them, or even challenge them. Uh, But first of all, perhaps, accept them and love them and welcome them. They once asked the great poet Robert Frost what the ugliest word, in his opinion, was in the English language. Frost thought about it for a moment and said, the ugliest word, and then he said, exclusive. There's not an exclusivity on the mountain of the Lord. But then notice this. Then the third thing is, they may, they're learning, they're accepting, but then they're walking. And, and biblically, walking means you're practicing, you're, you're practicing your faith. So we may not be trying to get in their face when they have different gods, but we are being true to our God, being true to our values, walking in our ways. There is a place for protest. Uh, especially when uh, we're experiencing um, now the realization of 400 years of injustice uh, against blacks. There's a place for protest. There's a place for evangelism, uh, for sharing widely the good news of Christ when we see how many people live lives of hopeless desperation. Uh, There is a place for both of those things. But there's also always a place for simply living your faith in the presence of people who do not share your faith. That may be the most powerful thing that you can do. I think Richard Rohr has said it best when he says this, the best criticism of the the bad is the practice of the better. He says, pouring oppositional energy only gets more of the same to come back toward you. So we see that they may walk with other gods, but we'll keep walking with our God on the mountain of the Lord. Up the road at uh, Baylor is a professor emeritus of uh, a religion, Rodney Stark. He's written a lot about the rise of Christianity in its first few centuries. Other people have written about it recently, Alan Kreider and Gerald Sitzer. But what they, the common points they seem to say is the church exploded in the first three centuries without having a plan. Really, there was a slight strategy you can, de- you can detect in Acts that Paul wanted to go to major centers and convert people in major centers of trade and traffic. But basically, after that, there wasn't really a, a big strategy or agenda, and yet the church exploded. How could it explode? And they point to the fact that it exploded in Rome because people who were Christians lived their values in the presence of other people who didn't share those values. And the three key values that often get lifted up were this. The early Christians practiced radical equality. Masters and slaves were equal in the house of God and washed one another's feet and served one another communion. Um, Radical equality between men and women. Women had opportunities in Christianity that simply were not available to them in the Roman Empire. The second thing they did is they practiced nonviolence. Uh, That even when they were persecuted uh, by the Romans, um, uh, they held fast patiently to their faith. And the third thing was they were frontline heroes and heroines. They were workers in the midst of two major plagues that hit Rome and the empire. The doctors left. The medical professionals left town so they wouldn't get these plagues. And the only folks left to minister to those who uh, were suffering from the plagues were the Christians who went out on the front lines. They were the healthcare heroes. And yes, a number of them died, but yes, also the plague was stopped. And uh, experts debate that, but they tend to say three things. One is it stopped because the Christians took care 
of people with the plague and actually nursed some back into faith. They say it stopped secondly because Christians prayed for those who had the plague and apparently some were miraculously healed. And thirdly, it stopped because many Christians ministered to those with the plague, survived it, and developed immunity, and so they moved toward what we call in our day herd immunity. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that you rush out if you are not a caregiver and find someone with COVID-19 and and get right in their face. I'm just telling you that when you practice equality, you practice nonviolence, you practice compassion, people notice, and it changes things. And so eventually Rome began to move toward Christianity. Now, I have to be honest, Eden didn't come. Eden didn't return fully at that time. But I want to tell you this, the people in Rome got a glimpse of Eden that they had not seen before. We live in a world desperate for a picture and glimpse of Eden, and maybe we can't bring it back all by ourselves, but we can certainly let them see that picture. For you see, the medium of communicating the vision of Eden is you and it is I together. I would invite you to now join in our closing hymn, hymn number 569 in the United Methodist Hymnal. We have a story to tell to the nations. Let us sing with our voices to God.
Thank you for being with us this morning. I invite you back at 9.30 for the children's time with Kim. Reminds you of the drive-in communion opportunity at 9.45 or uh, 10.15, whichever is better uh, for your schedule. I also want to thank Brad and Kim Kendall. They're up in the balcony um, uh, controlling things. And down here on the floor, Thad and uh, Mark providing music and uh, Kim Uh, and I are down here as well. We're so glad that you were with us. I remember when I started out in ministry a long time ago, maybe not when that song was written, it had been around a while, but uh, We've a Story to Tell the Nations was my favorite song to sing. And, And I remember then thinking that we had to tell it, and so we had to send missionaries, which are important. We needed evangelistic crusades and and great preaching. Um, I don't think those are not helpful, but now I think they must be accompanied by the kind of people who will live in their being uh, the picture that Micah has given us this morning. As you go from here, go uh, with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord uh, give up his, uh, his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen.